And, okay, I apologize. I feel like I'm a little overdressed tonight. So, uh, <laughs> I spend a lot of time in D.C. And so I, I wear the collar and the suit all the time because it just helps me get through the doors of power that I need to walk into. Um, and so it's sort of become my uniform. But we're going to spend some time over the next couple of days talking and sharing. Do me a favor. Close your eyes for a moment. I just want you to close your eyes for a moment. Today is April 25th, 27th, ooh, my bad, 2018. I want you to imagine it's April 2028. I want you to think about your children and your grandchildren, your nephews and your nieces, the kids on the community, the ones that go to the local school down the street. Think about yourselves for a moment. For everyone that you know, so that they are able to thrive, what has to happen in your community? For everyone to have a roof over their head, they have food, quality education, a decent job with benefits, retirement that you can really live off of. What has to happen between now and then? You can open your eyes. I just need five people, popcorn style, to tell me what is it that you need for your, yourself, your family, your community between now and then. Five minutes, yes ma'am. Access to affordable health care. Thank you. Yes, somebody else. Yes, ma'am. A home for everyone, yes, yes, sir. Progressive tax system. Progressive tax system, yes, yes, sir. A living wage for everyone. A living wage for everyone, yes. Accessibility for the disabled. Accessibility for the disabled, yes. Every child has a mentor. Every child has a mentor, yes. Anybody else? I was more than five. I'll give somebody else, yes. Get off plastic. Get off plastic. I got that. All right. Life, save the environment. Appreciate that. Gun sense. Gun sense, yes. Renewal of our moral fiber. Renewal of our moral fiber, yes. Jobs. Jobs, yes. Mental health care. Mental health care, yes, absolutely. No nuclear war. No nuclear war, yes. Funded schools. Funded schools, absolutely. Ending racism. Ending racism, yes. Yes, ma'am. Change in the criminal justice system. Change in the criminal justice system. mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. I believe that I serve the sovereign God of the universe, creator of heaven and earth and everything in between. I believe that this God sent God's son to have an encounter with humanity. And encountering humanity came to the conclusion we had some issues. <laughs> <laughs> and figured that there had to be a bridge between God and humanity and that became Jesus. I believe that that Jesus got up on the third day and according to our sacred text with all power in his hands. I believe that according to the work, the word of God, that that same Jesus said we would do greater works than he did. Amen. I believe that God has empowered us to not only be about witnessing, but be about winning. I believe, without a shadow of a doubt, that God has given each and every one of us a holy imagination to be a co-creator with the divine, to be able to desire and figure out what the world is supposed to look like. Yes. I believe we have that power. Yes. I believe that we have that power when we connect to each other. And not just the folk that live near me and look like me and sound like me and come from the same place. I believe the power is really only manifest when we reach out and we build relationships with folk that are not like us. 
The Bible says in the book of Genesis that the people got themselves together and decided to build a tower and then God caused confusion to come down. I don't know if it's a real story or not, but it's cute. And, and, <laughs> and caused confusion of the language. And that's supposedly how we got all of our nationalities and everything else. But I also remember the story in the book of Acts that on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came down, yes. oh. that people heard the message being proclaimed in every tongue and language that was gathered there so that they could be filled and go back and spread the good news. I am here this weekend to share with you a couple of things. One, that you have the power to transform your areas that you live in, no matter where your community is, no matter what your city is, you have the power by the spirit of the living God to be able to reimagine your communities, your neighborhoods, your states, to be able to make it so that they are states that work for every single person that lives in them. But I'm also here to tell you that you cannot do it by yourself. And that God never intended for us to wake up one morning and have the holy idea by ourselves and we were going to go do it, but that God desired for us to be in deep relationship with one another. Be living in a web of mutuality that is, has the capacity to be able to transform and change the world. I am going to push it here a little bit. <laughs> and say that God has called us to change the damn world. Why do I say that? Because there are folks in your community every morning who wake up and feel like they're already living in hell. We were at the table talking about their housing. Average house, $900,000. People are losing their homes. Seniors are trying to figure out if they're going to be able to pay for their medicine or pay for food. Education not being appropriately funded in the state. And so it puts, pits young people against seniors for the challenges that meet many needs. People not having jobs that pay enough. Folk leaving their homesteads where their generations have grown up. Family houses that should be gone from one generation to another are being lost because people can't, can't afford to keep them. People wonder, where's the church? Where's the church? Where is God? And sometimes, we're wondering too. But that's not the place we're going to stay. <laughs> because God sends revival winds to come through every once in a while. And sometimes you need a really deep crisis to get you kicked into gear and help you to understand the power that you have. And if there has ever been a time where this country has flipped into deep crisis, <laughs> it is right now. And it is my belief, without a shadow of a doubt, that God will show up in you to be able to transform and do the work that's necessary. But we gotta put our hands to the plow and not look back. We've gotta build some relationships and not be afraid. We've gotta knock on some doors and get to know some folk. And we have to believe that God desires for the faith community to own its own faith power. Amen. Amen, somebody. Amen, amen walls. Amen, ceiling. Amen, walls. <laughs> to own our own faith power and to believe that it is our imagination that will lead us the way. I'm sorry, there might be some business owners in here, but businesses at the end of the day are in it for profit. Amen, somebody. Amen. People are in it to make business. Politicians, okay, disclaimer, I'm a former politician. <laughs> So if any politicians in the room, I'm speaking because I have this experience. But anybody know what a politician's first responsibility is the day after election? Yeah. Get reelected, re right? That's their priority. But it's the church. It's the church. It's communities of faith that care about the people. I'll tell you this one quick story. It's a little bit of a teaser, and then we'll get ready to go for it tomorrow. Yeah. 
When I was working, I was the executive director of Power. It was Philadelphians organized to witness and power and rebuild. We started out as a city-wide uh, faith-based organizing movement, it became a statewide organization. Um, and there was a church that was a part of our work called Art Street United Methodist Church, which was a downtown church in Philadelphia. It really had no neighborhood with it um, because it was literally across from City Hall and a bunch of businesses. When Power first began, uh, we started with doing a deep listening campaign, and, and what we really were doing was going around having conversations with folk. And it's not coffee conversation. I know Starbucks is headquartered right down the way. That's a whole other story I'll talk about tomorrow because I've been in negotiation with them for the last two weeks about what happened in Philadelphia. But, but the, this is not just coffee conversation. This is getting below the surface. Most people, we really don't know each other. Even when we know each other, we don't really know each other. Because we have these conversations that are all above the surface. Amen. But we went deep and we started asking people like, what keeps you up at night? Right. And don't tell me your blood pressure medication. <laughs> but we began to ask questions like, what really keeps you up at night? And people were saying, nobody's ever asked me that question before. Because we weren't interested in all the, the nicey stuff, you know. I mean, we were concerned about your kids and your spouse and family and stuff like that. But we really wanted to know what was troubling your soul. We did 1,200 of those listening sessions in three months across the city, every section of our city. We had 250 uh, clergy and lay leaders that engaged in this work over the course of three months. And we got together and we began to compile all this information. But some, something unusual began to happen at Arch Street Church. Arch Street started having these conversations with folk that the people in their congregation just knew. Our street church started to grow. Not because people were coming there telling them they need to get saved, they need Jesus, but because the church was concerned about them, who they were as a person. So that a few years ago at the General Conference of the United Methodist Church, Art Street United Methodist Church won the National Denman Evangelism Award. And when Reverend Robin Heineken got up to give credit, he said it was the work that we learned from organizing that helped us to put people first, that we were able to grow our congregation and our work. I want to suggest to you today, family, that part of what it is that we're going to do over the next couple of days is not just about getting to know each other in a deeper way, but it's about getting to know one another in ways that pleases the divine and that causes people to draw together. People want to be where love is. If you go deep with somebody, it says, I love you. If you go deep with somebody, it says, I care about you. If you go deep with somebody, it says, you mean something to me. If you go deep with somebody, it says, I see you. And you have value and worth. So in the next couple of days, we're going to spend some time talking about building relationships. And then we're going to spend time talking about what does it mean to have revolutionary love with a holy imagination that can change the damn world. God bless your family.